Good morning. Um, my name is uh, Paolo Amarossiane, and uh, on request uh, 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 from a few students uh, who are not going to be able to to uh, attend online, attend to this this talk, uh, I have to say to to go this to, uh, for for them. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a new source of cryptos and waves, which I have. Uh, coined uh, extremely large mass resonance spirals, which is the capture of uh, a superstellar object by a supermassive black hole. In any case, uh, uh, before I start with this, I would like to mention something. You, you know that in astrophysics we have uh, uh, a particular field of uh, research which is called uh, high energy astrophysics, and uh, well, maybe I should say uh, uh, they have, uh, I don't know because I don't know anymore how to classify myself. Uh, but in any case, I don't like classifications. But in any case, um, there's a, a field called high energy astrophysics. Well, if you look at the, uh, at the kind of energy that uh, gravitational waves are releasing, for instance, uh, the gravitational waves uh, which have been registered, observed, like for instance, the first gravitational wave ever observed, uh, and uh, you calculate the total power output. Well, then uh, it, it turns out it turns it turns out that uh, that corresponds to more than fifty times all of the stars in the whole universe put together. That's a very very large number. Now here the trick in quotation marks is that we're talking about the total power. And uh, whenever you talk about power, you have to divide by time. And because the total duration was of about 20 milliseconds, you get this very huge number. Now, if uh, you want to uh, get a more modest number, then you talk in terms of energy. But uh, even in that case, the total energy corresponds to only, in quotation marks, again, three suns put entirely, completely, into energy and that being released by the source. Now, um, if you convert this to a uh, theory electron volts, you will find out that uh, this is equivalent to something like about, uh, say, 5,000 uh, supernovae put together. Uh, this kind of uh, power outputs and uh, energies correspond to, uh, to, to light stellar mass black holes. When you talk about supermassive black holes, then the, the, the numbers go up to 10 to the 60 tera electron volts, which is a very large number. Anyway, so to motivate uh, this talk, uh, I, I want to, to mention that there is, uh, of course, uh, as you know, there is a, a, a connection between, um, between the event horizon of a black hole and that the singularities to define them. And uh, uh, I will try to, to motivate uh, this kind of uh, gravitational wave source because uh, it is the best probe that we have to investigate the event horizon. If you investigate, if you can probe the event horizon, you have information about the singularity. Uh, modest a modest amount of information, but information nevertheless. Now, why is singularity is interesting? Well, singularity is interesting because, let me go back, because uh, uh, a singularity is where general relativity breaks down. A singularity seems like a very fancy name, but uh, you, could, you could just replace it with, uh, for instance, I don't know what goes on here, and uh, this is what it is. And that makes it interesting, right? Because uh, uh, general relativity is a very uh, honest theory and it tells you exactly where it breaks down at the singularity. Now uh, general relativity is a very robust theory as uh, everybody knows or thinks to know uh, uh, but uh, the point is that it is nevertheless a theory and that theories always break down and that we want to improve on that theory we want to move forward and uh, that's why it is interesting to look at the singularity. But uh, uh, in any case, uh, I, I am sure that uh, you have seen this uh, picture in which you, you look at the Big Bang and you have an exploding point 
which you know gives birth to the to the universe as we understand it well uh, that picture is uh, rubbish it's uh, meaningless a singularity is not anything in particular a big bang a big bang uh, 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 time like singularity is not a point in space time it's a much more complex problem you have uh, a space time which is singular if it's inextendable, which means that you cannot embed it uh, as an open set into another one, into a larger space time, and admits a causal curve which has a finite past, future, or the two of them. Now, uh, I'm going to skip this probably because I have a limited amount of time. Yes, uh, but anyway. So, uh, how do you in, in, uh, how, how can you interpret uh, singularities? Well, uh, the interpretation of this incomplete uh, wall line I have not mentioned what a wall line is, but uh, this is uh, you know a side effect of having a limited amount of time. It's not clear. An observer uh, with a causal curve, uh, which is uh, incomplete, would have a finite past, a finite future, or the two of them. And that what happens there, so beyond there, it's just, uh, you know, a, a very wild guess. And that's so because you are looking at a singularity in your manifold. It's something which does not belong into your manifold. So that it does not make sense to ask the question, what happens beyond that singularity? What happened before the Big Bang? Because uh, when, for instance, you fall into a Schwarzschild black hole, and uh, you reach the singularity in the future because it's a, it's a time-like singularity, it does not make sense to ask what happens after that because that's the end of time. Anyway, there are three conditions that you have to uh, fulfill uh, for uh, you know, <laughs> knowing that uh, you are dealing with a singularity, which is the posi positivity of energy, the existence of horizons, and uh, causality. Now, this means that if you admit that matter fields obey a given kind of energy condition and uh, you uh, admit as, as well that uh, your space time is going to be causal so that you are not, for instance, traveling, uh, uh, traveling at a, a speed larger than speed of light, then uh, if you have a horizon, you have a, you have a singularity so that if you investigate the horizon, you in some way have information about the singularity. And uh, this is very interesting because uh, you have a connection between geometry and topology. The integral over the curvature of a manifold is 2 pi the Eulier characteristic. So that thanks to the gauss bonnet theorem, we know that uh, we just need to find one geometry to link uh, uh, that geometry to the topology of a space-time. So that uh, by investigating a problem which at a, a first you know, uh, glance uh, looks like a, a, pure, a, pure, a pure astrophysical problem, in reality you are, you are, you know, uh, you are uh, uh, dealing with astrophysics, well astronomy, astrophysics, physics, uh, uh, of course you know, relativity, but also mathematics. And I think this is enough motivation. Okay, so when you have an extreme mass resolution spiral, I'm going to define what it is, uh, you have uh, an excellent probe of an event horizon. Now, um, when you take uh, a star like our sun and that uh, you throw it towards a supermassive black hole, that star will be distorted. It will, uh, the, the, the spherical sym symmetry the, well, to first order, uh, that the star has will be distorted. And uh, if uh, the passage through periapsis is close enough, and I'm not going to define what that close enough means, to the supermassive black hole, you could eventually turn apart uh, the, uh, the star. So you could uh, actually destroy it, completely destroy it. Now, if you replace that extended star, by a compact object, that destruction does not take place anymore. Now, 
uh, imagine that you take this, the, the mass of the sun plus half the mass of the sun and you compress it, you compress it sorry, uh, to, to, to the size of a city, I don't know, like uh, Berlin. Uh, you have something which is extremely compact. But that star, which is a compact object, for instance, a neutron star, is not going to be entirely torn apart by the difference of uh, uh, the gravitational pull acting onto it, which means that it can go through periapsis as many times as you want, so to say. In, in reality, the number of times that it goes through periapsis is a kind of proportional to the mass ratio. So that if you have a black hole of 10 to the 6 and you have a neutron star with a mass of about 1, you have a million of uh, 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 cycles before the neutron star falls into the event horizon. Uh, and it looks something like this. The, the important thing is that uh, because uh, this is not a Keplerian orbit, uh, you, are, uh, you are changing uh, the semi-neutral axis. You have, of course, a periapsis shift. And uh, you have, uh, if your central black hole is spinning, then the plane of the orbit is basculating, so that uh, uh, you can prove that uh, uh, that small compact object, which could be a neutron star or a black hole, is actually filling up a torus in phase space around the supermassive black hole. And that is extremely important because uh, de facto, what you are doing here is to uh, map space-time in a regime where you have a strong gravity. It's like a really doing a cartography of a warped uh, space-time. Now, there is an important point about here, about this here, which I want to mention. Uh, in general, the event rates, this last line here, in general, just ignore all of the text and just uh, listen to me, please. In general, the event rates are very low. So if you look at the Milky Way, for instance, and you look at the center of the Milky Way, we expect to have, say, uh, 10 to the minus 5 uh, stellar mass black holes or 10 to the minus 6 black holes uh, going through this kind of process towards the supermassive, supermassive black hole. Now, this is, of course, the same thing as saying that uh, if you, uh, you know, just uh, stay where, wherever you are and uh, you point uh, your detector towards the center of the, of, the, of the Milky Way, you have to wait of about, uh, say, 100,000 years or a million years before you see one of these things happening at the galactic center. Now, that's, that's a bit disappointing. But the important thing is that with an experiment like LISA, and I will briefly mention what the LISA is, you can achieve distances which are cosmological, right? Distances equivalent to a relative of about one and being extremely optimistic for. And you have millions and millions and millions of galaxies in that volume. So that if you multiply that number by millions and millions and millions, you get quite a decent number of events a year. Okay, so let's move on. Now, this extreme mass ratio in spirals, and uh, it is, I think, uh, quite clear why these things are called uh, this way, extreme mass, because uh, uh, mass ratio, because uh, one object has a mass of about 10 solar masses, the solar mass black hole, and the supermassive black hole has a mass of about, uh, in our case, at the Milky Way, uh, 4 million of solar masses. So you have an extreme mass ratio, and they are inspiring, right? They're going like this. Uh, just there's a, a reference here to a movie by uh, uh, Steve Graspo. I think uh, you can find it somewhere on the on the internet, and there's a very, very good example of uh, what these things are. Uh, so uh, there is. Look at this. Look at these words. There has not been any other mission conceived, planned, or even thought of ever in the history of mankind that can do the kind of science that uh, you do. You can do with extreme mass resource spirals. Now, I mentioned this already. General relativity is a very good theory, but it needs corroboration. And this is a unique probe in the strong gene. And uh, the wall line of embrace of extreme mass resource spirals 
they, they give you a geodesic uh, uh, description of space-time and geo in quotation marks because uh, geo, uh, uh, well, the, the, the ancient Greek root means earth and we're not talking about the earth, we're talking about black holes, but anyway. So uh, these are excellent proofs of the geometry of space-time around these dark objects, which I am uh, uh, assuming uh, to be uh, supermassive black holes. And that because we have uh, a number of cycles, which is kind of uh, 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 proportional to the mass ratio, so uh, 100,000 cycles, 100,000 snapshots of space-time all around the sequence of black hole. So here, here, and here, and here. So different angles, different inclinations, different symmetry axes, different um, um, uh, periapses. Uh, uh, you have uh, de facto. It's like having it's like having a, a flying camera taking pictures of space-time around a, a, a supermassive black hole, so that you can uh, run tests of alternative theories of gravity, like chance science, for instance. And they, they deliver an incredible measure with an incredible accuracy of the red-shifted parameters, in particular the mass and the spin, with an unprecedented precision. And uh, the most important thing, the most interesting thing, is that uh, you are not modeling anything. Your only assumption here is general relativity. This is a direct reading of the mass, of the redshifted mass, spin, and the other parameters. And in the case of these two parameters, you can obtain the mass, the redshifted, again, I must insist upon this point, uh, uh, the redshift mass with a tiny error of about 1 and 0.1%, and the case of the spin between 0.1 and 0.01%. So, all of this is very wonderful, this is uh, amazing, nice, etc. But uh, the point is, can you actually detect them? This is, uh, is this a theoretical problem, or is this uh, something that uh, you can actually uh, measure at some point with a detector. And the, the, the answer is that uh, you can detect it because we have something called the delays interferometer at space antenna, which is a kind of, uh, if you want, LIGO Virgo. It corresponds actually to two orthogonal detectors funded by ESA and NASA with uh, a size of about, no, no, of about not of 2.5 million kilometers with a resolution of, a, of, of one picometer on, on those 2.5 million kilometers. Uh, now, uh, yes, I always say that uh, Lisa is a, it's a very, very expensive experiment. And uh, in the past, I used to say this is equivalent to, you know, two leagues of Spanish football. Uh, and I say that for years, and uh, um, one evening I uh, I decided to actually check that number, and it turns out that it was wrong. It is equivalent to about half of the cost of the first edition of Spanish Liga. In particular, if you remove from this plot, which this is the amount of millions of uh, euros, and uh, uh, order it by uh, uh, amount of uh, those millions of euros uh, uh, by the different teams, if you took out these two teams, which are the Barcelona and the Real Madrid from the Spanish Liga, we, we could fund this today and have it launched. Well, actually, technology requires a little bit more time, but anyway, so you get the point. Uh, so the fact is that this is an extremely expensive experiment, and the ESA and the NASA are not going to give you the clearance uh, for this mission. If you don't prove that you can do the, the, the technology, because uh, from a technological point of view, this is something completely new. So that uh, a group of uh, very smart scientists, and of course, uh, by definition, I was not uh, in that group, uh, uh, developed something which they uh, uh, called the LISA Pathfinder, which was a kind of a shrunk version of LISA. And uh, 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 this is uh, 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 a measurement of the differential acceleration as a function of the frequency. These were the uh, uh, requirements imposed by ESA, because it was a purely uh, ESA mission. 
so that uh, uh, well you know if you make it to this uh, to this curve you're fine now when uh, they launched the list of finder they got it here at about uh, say well almost uh, well no uh, depending on the frequency uh, by one or a little bit more than one uh, 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 order of magnitude better than required and that almost one year later they had improved on it so that uh, if you have here the full lease emission so the 2.5 million kilometers this is really the, the full blown up lease emission uh, by February 2017 they have they had achieved a better uh, sensitivity than required so uh, well uh, thanks to these people to these very smart people we uh, they well they have now uh, the proof that uh, we can do this from a technological point of view okay now as i was saying before uh, uh, there is one problem if you look at the galactic center uh, you have to wait between 100,000 years, if not 1 million years, to see one of these things, right? One uh, uh, extreme mass radiation spiral. And that, that's, that's a bit disappointing because uh, since the galactic center is so close to us, only 8,000 parsecs, 8 kiloparsecs, uh, the signal to noise ratio would be huge. It would be a bomb if we had something in there when LISA was launched. Because the duration of LISA is only of about, say, 10 years, being optimistic, and uh, uh, you have to wait uh, 100,000 years, if not 1 million years, the chances that uh, you have uh, uh, an extreme mass resistance spiral when LISA is launched are basically zero, right? So, um, uh, this, this led me to think about a different possibility. So uh, let's, have, let's have a look at uh, the following curve, at the, at the following plot, sorry. And in this plot, I am showing, I am displaying the minimum mass that a supermassive black hole must have so that a, a, an object, whatever object, with this kind of masses can cross the event horizon uh, without being tidally disrupted. That means, for instance, if you look at this curve, which corresponds to a red giant of 50 uh, solar radii, that uh, for uh, if you have uh, a star with a mass of, uh, say, 10 solar masses, we go up on this curve, if, uh, if you are above that curve, so for supermassive black holes with this kind of mass, that kind of a star can cross the event horizon without uh, suffering a significant uh, tidal stress on it. And therefore, it is a successful source of gravitational waves. Now, let's, let's have a look at, uh, at the main sequence stars and the brown dwarfs. This blue line here. This is spanning from 100 to about 10 to the minus 3 solar masses. And of course, from here, from here to there, we're talking about brown dwarfs. So failed stars. A brown dwarf is a star which never started to you know, uh, emit radiation like our sun. In a, in a significant in a significant amount now because our supermassive black hole is located here so four million of solar masses this range of masses which correspond on the x-axis to what uh, uh, you understand by a brown dwarf so between 10 to the minus uh, two solar masses and up to at most one solar mass this kind of uh, 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 solar masses can in principle but actually by the way one is uh, is out of that line okay uh, that range of masses so substellar objects typically in this range of masses can in principle cross the event horizon without being tidally disrupted 
Okay, so uh, please humor me. Let's assume that uh, we had one of these substellar objects at the galactic center when this is launched. What would happen in terms of, for instance, signal to noise ratio? Well, this is what would happen. This is signal to noise ratio for LISA for one year of observation, so that uh, we're being uh, pessimistic. And it means that uh, if uh, you can observe that source for one year, or if, I mean, if for, for whatever reasons uh, LISA exploded after one year of, uh, of lifetime, uh, this is the kind of signal to noise ratio that uh, you would have accumulated. Now, uh, this is the time to plunge. And uh, over here, we have 100 millions before the plunge. This is 10 millions, 1 million, 100,000, 10,000, and so on, down, uh, down, to, down to the plunge. This is one, one year before the plunge. And uh, you can see, well, I, I have this composition here on the different harmonics, which you just uh, ignore the different colors and look at the solid line over here. We see that already a few million years before the last plunge, we have a signal to noise ratio, which is between say 10 and 100. Now, uh, this very steeply increases to the point that about 100,000 years, you are approaching the 1,000 in the signal to noise ratio, so that you're getting closer and closer to the kind of signal to noise ratios that we have for supermassive black hole binaries. And that if you progress on time, meaning that you're getting closer and closer and closer to the plunge, to you know the uh, small superstellar object uh, crossing the event horizon, you can end up having signal to noise ratios close to 10,000 or actually surpassing 10,000. In this case, we have 20,000, uh, about uh, a few hundred years before the plunge. So uh, this would be a bomb because just imagine that uh, you launch LISA today, you switch it on, and uh, suddenly you have a source in band which is emitting at a signal to noise ratio of uh, 10,000 or 1,000 or a few thousand, that would completely bury the rest of sources for LISA. Now, uh, I don't, I don't know if you can, if you can see the different levels here, but uh, I can, I can, I can uh, describe them for you. So uh, first of all, this is this is the characteristic strain. So that this is delta I, delta L divided by L. So this is dimensionless. This is how much you can stretch or compress uh, uh, the, the, the the distance between the free falling masses in the experiment, and the, this is the frequency in hertz. Ten to the minus five is here. Ten to the minus three. Ten to the minus two. Ten to the minus one. And uh, I have a, this, the, this, the composition of the first uh, few harmonics in a particular approximation for a black hole with a mass corresponding to the black hole that we have in our galaxy, four million of solar masses, and a brown dwarf with a mass of uh, 10 to the minus five solar masses, which is a representative, uh, uh, if you want, uh, pessimistic, conservative mass. So I am trying not to blow up the numbers with a typical uh, initial eccentricity and a typical initial cinematic axis. Now, uh, this point that you can see here corresponds to the moment in the evolution in which you still have to wait a five, uh, 5,000 years before the uh, uh, superstellar object plunges to the event horizon. And from this point here to that point here, you have to wait, well, 4,999 years because this is one year before the last plunge. And in that amount of time, we have barely moved in frequency. So that from the point of view of LISA, 
these sources are going to be just monochromatic, meaning that they will be, you know, nailed at a given frequency. Now, this is a slightly different uh, uh, example with a slightly different uh, initial uh, parameters for the signature axis and eccentricities, but uh, we, we see the same behavior. And the distance to the source is, uh, well, is the galactic center. Now, so these are very, we have very large mass ratios and they are very loud. So we have mass ratios of about 10 to the 8. Now, the important and nice thing about this is that back reaction depends on the mass ratio. And that for this kind of max, mass ratios, uh, the orbit uh, uh, is more and more similar to a standard geodesic. And uh, that's very nice because it is indeed very difficult to model uh, 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 smaller mass ratios. So uh, in general relativity, we can model very well similar mass ratios of up to, say, uh, 100 solar masses, probably a little less than that. But anything between 100 and 10 to the 7 is a real pain. But when you get to 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, things start to be very nice. Because uh, the orbit, the world line, of the extreme mass ratio spiral, which in this case is an extremely mass ratio, is getting closer and closer to a standard geodesic, and therefore it is easy to model. Now, we're talking about synchrotronous ratios of hundreds, thousands, and tens of thousands. So this is perfect to extract parameters. But that these synchrotronous ratios from these exembries this is how I have coined them, extremely mass ratio spares. Actually, it was uh, uh, Bernard Schutz uh, who uh, uh, suggested this, this name to me. In, uh, it was actually it was Christmas, so this is a kind of a fun thing. Uh, uh, they have uh, uh, such a huge synchrotron ratios that in principle, we could bury all binaries to be uh, uh, measured by uh, Belize because, of course, if they live so for such a long time on band, uh, uh, for all of the duration of LISA, you're going to have a constant emission of gravitational waves at a synchronous ratio varying between, say, in the most modern case, tens uh, up to, uh, uh, in the most impressive case, 20,000. But it would be a source easy to subtract, subtract and therefore uh, uh, recover the rest of uh, the sources because you can model it very easily. Okay. Now, uh, because I have already been talking for 33 minutes, uh, I'm going to skip all of this section in which I explain how to derive uh, the uh, number of uh, superstellar objects, so brown dwarfs that uh, you can expect to have that close to the supermassive black hole. Because, of course, if you had zero, that would be, well, a bit of a dumb script, because you would not have any sources. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, if you had uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, that would be a very big problem as well, because you would have a kind of uh, foreground. But in any case, it is important to understand uh, how so how many years do you need to wait until one of these brown dwarfs crosses the event horizon? But there is a very important point here. Uh, remember that this brown dwarf is going to spend up to millions of years in bound. And uh, we are asking the question here, how long? So. Uh, how, how many of these bundles are going to be crossing the event horizon per year? And these two things are different, as we will see. In any case, all of this is corresponds to, uh, to the astrophysical study of, uh, of, uh, of this topic, and I'm going, to, I'm going to skip it because I don't have time to explain how I derived these uh, event rates. But in any case, you can see the, the summary 
in this plot. Over here, you have uh, on, on the z-axis, you have the event rate. Uh, uh, please note that this, this is being multiplied by 10 to the minus 3 as a function of the inclination of the orbit and the spin of the supermassive black hole. But in any case, just, just have a look have a look at the z-axis. So we have something of the order 10 to the minus 3. So uh, um, if in one case we had uh, 10 to the minus 5 uh, for, for the stellar mass black, uh, uh, black holes, and now we have uh, 10 to the minus 3, well, yes, we have gained two orders of magnitude, you could say, and that's not, uh, you know, a very significant thing. Yes, uh, you don't have to wait a hundred thousand years. You have to wait a thousand years. So for you know, for matters, uh, for practical matters at the galactic center, we don't have. We're not going to see any brown dwarf crossing the event horizon when this flies. But uh, this is the point to which I was referring before. The important thing here is not that. How many of these sources are crossing the event horizon per year, but the combination of the lifetime of these things in band and the event rate of these uh, brown dwarfs. Okay, so what does this mean? Uh, remember, uh, this is a more explicit plot of the kind of uh, what I was showing before. This is 10 to the 8 years, I think, yes, before the last plunge. This is an isochrome, by the way. Um, so each point here corresponds to a different harmonic of the gravitational wave. Uh, this is 10 to the 10 to the uh, yes, yes, I think so. I cannot, I cannot read it myself. <laughs> this is wait, yes, 10 to the seven, uh, 10 to the six, 10 to the five, 10 to the four, a thousand, a hundred years. So you can see that this thing is. is evolving extremely slowly in band. So, uh, because they spend such a long time, and we have seen that the lifetime with a signal-to-noise ratio above the threshold, which we define to be 10 in LISA, is of about 10 million years. And you have an event rate of 10 to the minus 3 a year. You have to multiply these two numbers. So you have of about, uh, say, 10,000 of these, right, in principle. But uh, not all of these are going to be in band. It depends on the symmetry axis. And uh, from the continuity equation of the events, which I didn't explain, you can derive the relative occupation fraction of the line density. So uh, this is the line density, G, defined to be the number of events uh, uh, as a, so uh, the, you know, uh, the, uh, the change of events uh, depending on the, the symmetry axis as a function of the symmetry axis itself. Uh, you have a flux of uh, events coming from the right and you can define three zones. This is this first zone which uh, 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 spans from the max maximum symmetry axis. All of the details are given, by the way, here in uh, in this paper, so that uh, I hope you can find the answer to to, to your questions if you have any. Uh, so that uh, you can define a, a maximum symmetry axis from which you have a a, a, a warranty that uh, these brown dwarfs will eventually. Uh, turn into uh, an extremely an extremely large mass region spiral down to the critical symmetry axis, which is uh, the symmetry axis in which uh, uh, from which you can you can you can say that the orbit of uh, the extremely large extremely large uh, mass region spiral is in band. Now I have defined here, and this is a, a very rough approximation. I know. Uh, you know, a kind of uh, break uh, symmetry axis from which your sources will turn from uh, eccentric into circular ones. So two corresponds to uh, uh, eccentric orbits, but uh, they are losing uh, energy and angular momentum so that they are circularizing, and they eventually will turn into circular orbits. 
and that over here is where they match with the supermassive black hole. So there is a very slow progression in this curve from the right to the left. So the, the, the closer and closer they get to the left, the faster and faster they evolve, right? Uh, in any case, uh, just taking, by taking into account the boundary conditions and uh, the uh, eccentricity of the sources, when integrating the number of sources, you can find, uh, uh, because you have the weights, you have time life, and uh, you have uh, the occupation fractions, you can, find the, the, you can find the final numbers. So that in this uh, band, uh, uh, where the sources have circularized already, you expect to have 30 sources. In this band, where the, uh, the uh, objects are still eccentric and they have low signatonous ratios from tens to hundreds, uh, you expect to have of about 40. In this band, by the way, you expect to have uh, signatonous ratios from hundreds up to 20,000. But the interesting thing about this plot and all of the analysis that I did before and I did not explain is that this description is a, is a statistical one. So that this is the number of sources of round balls which are going to be in the Lisa band at any given moment, meaning today, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, and a 1,000 years in the past. This is a steady configuration. So that when Lisa flies, if I did not make any mistake in the calculations, this is what you expect to have of about 40 sources with a relatively low uh, signatonous ratios, tens to hundreds, and that's, well, that's not low, uh, being eccentric and uh, difficult to model because they are eccentric, and that you will have of the same order tens of uh, sources with uh, signatonous ratios as large as uh, say 20,000 and down to a few uh, uh, hundreds in, uh, in the uh, uh, circular regime so that uh, these ones will be easy to model. So, the conclusions. Uh, extreme maturation spirals are extreme, extreme uh, maturation spirals. They are extremely loud at the last stages of the evolution and they can go up to signatonous rates of 10,000. So that that will allow us to do an extremely accurate detection uh, and parameter extraction. Uh, now, the question uh, 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 you know, emerges uh, whether these uh, signatonous ratios are a problem for the detection of binaries. And these mass ratios of 10 to the 8, because back reaction uh, depends on the mass ratio, you can approach more and more the orbit with a geodesic. And we kind of know how geodesics look like around the curved black holes. Now, at any given time, as I just, as I, uh, as I just explained, you have uh, tens of sources in band. About 30 sources with 13 to, to noise ratios between a few hundreds and up to 20,000, and about 40 sources with synchronous noise ratios between a few tens and up to a few hundreds. Because of the large synchronous noise ratios, we can see extreme, extremely large mass ratios, exemplars, from nearby galaxies such as M32. And the question is whether uh, this uh, 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 X embrace can vary uh, the rest of the signals. In any case, that's it, and uh, uh, thanks a lot.